Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 2022 series on specially targeted education program, building COVID-19 vaccine confidence by educating the educators. Just to remind you, this program will be recorded and is being run in collaboration with the Sickest Learning Institute, the Black Creek Community Health Center, the Scarborough Health Network VaxFast Clinic, and the Black Physicians Association of Ontario. We are privileged today to be uh, talking to a very special guest who will be discussing the monitoring of vaccine safety in Ontario and Canada. Before I introduce her again, uh, I will do the land acknowledgement. We do acknowledge that the land on which circuits operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat and the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit Valley. Today, Toronto is home to indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Sekis is committed to working toward new relationships that include First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, and is grateful for the opportunity to share this land in caring for children and their families. So this afternoon, we are privileged to have Dr. Sarah Wilson, who is a public health physician at the Public Health Ontario, where she specializes in immunization. She's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Public Health and Preventive Medicine, and is an assistant professor at the Dalanana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and an adjunct scientist at ISIS, formerly the Institute of Clinical Evaluation Sciences. She's also a member of the Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization. And during this ever active COVID-19 response, She's been the medical lead for vaccine safety surveillance at Public Health Ontario. So we couldn't have a better person today to address the topic today. Dr. Wilson, thanks for making this session and over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for the kind introduction. And most of all, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be part of these sessions. Um, so I'm really passionate about the COVID-19 vaccine program as I am about immunization in general, but also, you know, really passionate about the important role that vaccine safety surveillance plays in our program delivery and monitoring. So the objectives for today's presentation are to first just to, pri to provide an overview of the surveillance systems used in Ontario, as well as in Canada, to monitor the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine program. I'll also describe some examples of enhanced surveillance for adverse events of special interest, and then close by sharing how to find up-to-date information on vaccine safety, and also share with you some recent data from Ontario in terms of our COVID-19 vaccine program. And then before I get into more detail in the presentation, I'd just like to mention that in terms of disclosures, I work at Public Health Ontario. I have no relationships with private industry and no past or present relationships with any vaccine manufacturers. So I'm gonna start first just with an overview of vaccine safety surveillance and the systems that we use to do this work. So first of all, this is just a reminder to me to situate this talk on vaccine safety surveillance in the broader context in which vaccine safety occurs, which also includes studying vaccine safety in the setting of pre-licensure clinical trials represented in the upper left or upper left hand corner, um, the rigorous review that Health Canada undertakes once these submissions are sent to Health Canada to determine whether a product will be authorized for use in Canada. Um, it also includes a review of that information as well as other programmatic advice from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization continues further with Health Canada's involvement in testing of batches of vaccine, ensuring that quality standards are met. And then of course, these are integrated into programs under other rigorous um, controls, including cold chain requirements. 
until finally we get to this bottom left hand portion of the slide which is talking about post marketing vaccine safety surveillance so i just wanted to ensure that you know although it's critically important it's not it's not the only step of uh, vaccine safety uh, activities um, in in canada and just i always need to remind myself of this before i go right into the details of vaccine safety surveillance so when I think about vaccine safety surveillance, I think about it in terms of three main pillars, passive, active, and then special studies. So passive vaccine safety surveillance is probably what most people think of when they think about post-marketing surveillance. These are sometimes described as spontaneous reports. These are the reports that healthcare providers complete after they see a patient who has some sort of medical diagnosis or maybe something unexpected that is temporally related in time to immunization. And these reports are then submitted to public health. A strong complement to our passive vaccine safety monitoring is active vaccine safety surveillance. So in contrast to the passive system that waits for these reports to be submitted to public health, active vaccine safety surveillance involves proactively looking for events, proactively eliciting symptoms. And so this is a very important component to ensure that you know, what we're seeing in our passive vaccine safety surveillance to ensure that, you know, there isn't anything else that might be happening that we might be missing if there isn't complete reporting. And so we'll provide some specific examples of how, um, how this is done in Canada and the, and the vaccine safety surveillance networks focused on active vaccine safety, how this occurs in Canada. And then finally, there's this group that I describe as special studies. And so you can imagine that, you know, if there are uh, signals or findings from passive or even active vaccine safety surveillance, there's oftentimes a need to really assess these further, assess these further even in terms of controlled epidemiologic studies to try to address, you know, any bias or any factors that might be present in passive reports, as well as just the value of collecting additional clinical information, additional descriptors to really better understand a new or emerging vaccine safety event. So these three different groups and different styles of surveillance and studies are all critically important and all um, are different and complement each other. So let's then go on to passive vaccine safety surveillance, which is such a fundamental underpinning of all vaccine safety surveillance work. So um, it's adverse events following immunization that are reported to passive systems. So what is an adverse event following immunization? You can see that there's a lot of text on this slide to describe that it encompasses a variety of different things. So at its core, an adverse event following immunization is really an untoward medical occurrence. It could be, an, it could be a sign, a symptom, a lab finding, or an actual diagnosis. And the key aspect here is that these AFEs are temporally associated with the vaccine. So the event has occurred after the administration of vaccine, but it absolutely is not necessarily causally associated with vaccine. And so this is something that we always really emphasize when we discuss with, um, in particular with clinicians about AFI reporting is that we have no expectation and certainly do not ask for clinicians to do any sort of formal or informal causality assessment. We really wanna receive all reports and the subsequent work of causality assessment can occur once we have a broad range of diverse reports within our system. And then the final thing I'll just note is that um, although um, you know, there are um, a range of different AFIs that um, are medical events described as AFIs that were included in our surveillance system. We really try to differentiate AFIs from what I would describe as symptoms of reactogenicity, which I would use the language of side effects to describe. So we know that these are expected reactions. And from a passive vaccine safety surveillance system, we just don't have the resources to follow up on every single you know, self-limited sore arm or self-limited fever. We do just have additional surveillance criteria to ensure that fever in association with other events or, you know, um, injection, pain, swelling that persists after, you know, several days that those are still included, but really try to differentiate sort of common anticipated side effects um, as different from what we're typically capturing as adverse events within our surveillance system. 
So the goals of passive vaccine safety surveillance, first and foremost, are really to identify rare events that, you know, simply don't have a high likelihood of being identified in pre-licensure clinical studies um, if they are indeed very rare events. So I think, you know, we've had lots of experience in the COVID-19 vaccine program in terms of reflecting on myocarditis or VIT in terms of, you know, these events not having been originally detected in even very, very large pivotal clinical trials. And if there is a safety signal identified I think a common description of the role passive vaccine surveillance plays is that of hypothesis generation. You know, if there is a signal that's detected, it needs to go on to further analytic work to say, you know, is the observed number of events greater than what we would expect based on baseline trends? Are there particular factors that are at play here in terms of age or underlying comorbidities that might also play a role in this particular vaccine safety? And then finally, the reason why we're doing passive vaccine safety surveillance is to ensure the ongoing safety of the COVID, of, in this instance, the COVID-19 vaccine program. But so this final collection of bullets is really to emphasize that, you know, if there are vaccine safety issues that are identified through real-time monitoring, it does present the opportunity to make changes either to the product label or product monograph to ensure that there's appropriate counseling about a rare adverse event, um, as well as uh, once there's additional data and evidence to support a particular finding, um, you know, is an opportunity for vaccine programs and national advisory committees to reflect on whether there's any modifications to a vaccine program that could be put in place to, to reduce the, the risk of, um, of a rare adverse event. So this is an example of how passive vaccine safety surveillance can actually drive and influence uh, program changes and modifications. So this is a, a schematic that highlights a, a, a sequence of events that occurs in the setting of passive vaccine safety surveillance and highlights the range of different groups and organizations and stakeholders involved in passive vaccine safety surveillance in Ontario and in Canada. So starting on the far left of this slide, this reflects the reporting of an adverse event following immunization using our provincial form, which I'll share in an upcoming slide. So I would say that most of our reports are completed by healthcare providers, but we do from time to time also receive reports either from vaccine recipients or their parents or caregivers. And these are submitted to local public health units where they receive the report and they it, certainly in the case of vaccine recipients and caregivers would follow up with the healthcare provider and determine whether there's any additional information that's, that's needed as part of their investigation and reporting into the provincial surveillance system. So once public health units collect any additional information that may be needed, that event is entered into the provincial system that we at Public Health Ontario then have access to in terms of having a single database with all of this information. We also spend quite a bit of our time also supporting public health units in terms of providing advice on how the event should be classified or if there's additional clinical information that would be helpful to collect. And we do the work of provincial vaccine safety surveillance in close collaboration with our Ministry of Health colleagues. So in addition to any analytic work we might be doing summarizing our provincial data at Public Health Ontario, we also submit the individual case reports to the Public Health Agency of Canada. And so this, uh, these case reports then are sent to the Canadian Adverse Event Following Immunization Surveillance System or CAFIS, so that in Canada, we also have a national viewpoint on the vaccine safety. And our Public Health Agency of Canada colleagues are looking at this data in close collaboration with the regulator. So in Canada, the regulator is Health Canada and because reports may also be submitted to vaccine manufacturers themselves, these are submitted to Health Canada. There is close collaboration between the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada in reviewing reports that come both through the public health system as well as through vaccine manufacturers to provide that national um, lens on vaccine safety surveillance. 
So this is a screenshot of our provincial AFI form. This is a form that uh, has evolved quite a bit over time. And in particular, in the setting of the COVID-19 vaccine program, we've, we've modified it a fair bit to capture additional adverse events of special interest and ensure that you know, there's um, opportunity to report adverse events that we weren't necessarily expecting to be included as part of our surveillance um, in early 2021. To find this form, you just have to Google Ontario AFI form, or you can go directly to our Public Health Ontario website. It's very easy to find through online searches or just searching on our PHO website. And once this is completed, um, this goes to your local public health unit, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the lead for um, collecting any additional information. And just wanted to also emphasize that although the form looks very daunting in terms of the amount of information and, and various um, cells and tables, you know, really um, the minimum amount of information about the client, the adverse event, and, you know, to, to start and kickstart an investigation is, is really all that's needed. And we really encourage you to just, you know, report whatever you have available at the time and the public health unit will follow up if there is additional information um, that they need at that time. So I also just wanted to spend a few moments just sort of trying to highlight the types of things that are happening behind the scenes, so to speak, sort of the invisible work that most people aren't aware is occurring at the provincial level. And of course, this builds upon the tremendous resources that local public health units put into vaccine safety surveillance as well. So at Public Health Ontario, we have a multidisciplinary team comprised of nurse consultants who have um, specialized expertise in vaccine safety. We have a number of public health physicians as well as other physicians, some, um, several of which still do ongoing clinical work, as well as a team of epidemiologists. And so together the team is reviewing on a daily basis all of the AFEs that are being reported into the provincial system. Uh, our nurse consultants are providing advice to public health units who may have questions about complex AFEs in terms of how to classify them in the surveillance system or potentially advice on uh, re-immunization or clinical referrals for, for individuals with complex AFEs. Um, and then there's also scoring of the events in terms of using international case definitions developed by the Brighton Collaboration to really provide you know, different levels of diagnostic certainty for various adverse events. And then of course, our epidemiologist team is spending a huge amount of time reviewing the data, um, producing reports, the reporting to the Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as our own provincial weekly analyses in addition to any, um, any other sort of self-directed analytic work for further fair, further characterization of Ontario AFEs. And then finally, just highlighting that Ontario um, participates with all other provinces and territories, as well as Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada in the Vaccine Vigilance Working Group. So this is a weekly forum to share information about vaccine safety, what, what uh, different provinces and territories are seeing, and for the Public Health Agency of Canada to share a lot of the, the deep analytic work that they're doing on signal detection and other vaccine safety analyses. So next, I'm going to just briefly move on to active vaccine safety surveillance, as I mentioned, an important complement to passive vaccine safety surveillance. So the first example to share is IMPACT, which is the Canadian Immunization Monitoring Program Active. And this is a pediatric active vaccine safety surveillance network that has been in place in Canada since the early 1990s. So it um, has um, a long history of supporting vaccine safety in Canada and has really pivoted in COVID-19 to also look at pediatric COVID-19 vaccines, uh, pardon me, looking at COVID-19 vaccine um, AFEs and is um, also including additional centers in Ontario. So historically, there have been 12 pediatric tertiary care centers covered by IMPACT, representing about 90% of all tertiary care beds. And then um, for the COVID-19 program, an additional center in Ontario has been included. So these include the Hospital for Sick Children, CHEO, as well as McMaster Children's Hospital. 
Next is the Canadian National Vaccine Safety or Canvas Network. So this is another vaccine, active vaccine safety network in Canada. So in contrast to IMPACT, which is focused on children being seen in the eMERGE or seen in hospital, this is a strategy of active vaccine safety surveillance that involves contacting individuals after they've been vaccinated to determine what, if any, symptoms they may be experiencing. So this uh, Canvas network um, involves seven different provinces and territories representing about 75% of the Canadian population and the recruitment approach varies a little bit by province. So in Ontario, the way Canvas has been set up is that at the time of the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccinees are asked whether or not they consent to receive emails about research projects through COVAX, COVAX being the um, system or the database or registry used in Ontario for COVID-19 vaccines. So if the vaccinee or in the setting of children, if the parent says yes um, to this question about consent for research, research emails, the uh, COVAX will automatically send, in, send an email uh, to the email account registered and telling the individual about the Canvas um, project and its role in active vaccine safety monitoring in Canada and includes a link to the Canvas website where individuals can um, consent and enroll in Canvas. Of course, individuals can also go to the Canvas website on their own and decide to enroll um, in Canvas um, if they wish to do so. So after enrolling in Canvas, what happens is that the individual receives a questionnaire about a week after dose one, a week after dose two, and then six months after the primary series is complete, asking the individual about any symptoms after immunization. So any sort of symptoms of reactogenicity like fever, chills, um, et cetera, as well as asking about severe health events that would interfere with work or school attendance, as well as any events that required seeing a healthcare provider or otherwise um, medical attention. And I wanted to highlight this final piece because in, in Ontario, Public Health Ontario has been closely collaborating with the Canvas team so that if there are any medically attended events that are identified through Canvas recipients, that we um, work with the Canvas team to ensure that those are entered into our passive vaccine safety surveillance system. So we receive them at Public Health Ontario and refer them to public health units for further investigation. So they're included in our passive system. And then the far right is just some nice screenshots from the Canvas website that highlights the more than 1 million individuals who've participated in Canvas so far and some, some recent findings. So next I'm going to move on to the topic of enhanced surveillance and enhanced surveillance in particular for adverse events of special interest. So adverse events of special interest are a are an example of a group of adverse events following immunization that were identified prior to the launch of the COVID-19 vaccine program. And these were identified in collaboration with the Brighton Collaboration. So this is an international group of vaccine safety experts that advise on vaccine safety initiatives, including in consultation with international clinical groups, advising on international case definitions for various events, including adverse events of special interest. So I think what's quite interesting about this, um, this initiative was that, you know, thinking about roughly about a year ago before COVID-19 vaccines were deployed in programs, this group was looking at the literature um, in, in relation to wild type COVID-19 infections, looking at, you know, what was the pathogenesis, what were the various clinical sequelae associated with wild type COVID-19 infection to identify quite a lengthy list of adverse events um, following immunization that should really be prioritized as part of vaccine safe, safety initiatives internationally. Um, so this list was used by a number of different groups, including in Canada and in, in Ontario, to ensure that we had surveillance classifications for this broad list of adverse events. Um, and the Brighton Collaboration has identified um, in addition to just their uh, support for reporting on these, 
uh, specialized case definitions for many of these events. Um, so there is the, this document that I've included here as a screenshot lists the recommendations for a range of adverse events of special interest. And these are just some examples in terms of, um, you know, even back in December 2020, identifying myocarditis as well as multi-system inflammatory syndromes, just as, as some very select examples. So one of the things, I'll just flip back to this one slide again, just, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of passive vaccine safety surveillance, one of the things that we need to do when, especially when we're looking at rare adverse events following immunization that may be reported is really trying to understand, you know, what are we seeing in terms of the observed events, the events that are being reported into our system, and how do these compare with the expected number of events, recognizing that, you know, unrelated to the COVID-19 vaccine program or unrelated to immunization, some individuals might still have developed a particular event. So we're very lucky in Ontario, uh, we have the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences or ICES, who have rich administrative data sets. And so we've collaborated at PHO, we've collaborated with our colleagues at ICES, who are also collaborating with uh, colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada in terms of really understanding what are the background rates of various adverse events of special interest and looking at these in relation to age groups as well as um, in relation to gender. And so this is just a screenshot of a preprint that summarizes some of the figures that have been produced that have been used as part of our passive vaccine safety surveillance work to look at the relationship between observed events and expected number of events. So this is quite a busy figure, I recognize, but it just highlights a variety of different adverse events of special interest. Um, and then looking at you know, different, um, or pardon me, looking at incidence rates by gender as well as by age. And I think probably the most interesting figure to look at, if I can just highlight one of them is on the far right, looking at myocarditis and pericarditis, where you can see, you know, that um, the trends in myocarditis and pericarditis vary quite a bit and vary quite a bit by age and gender. So this has been, I think, really important work for us as we've been looking at events of myocarditis and pericarditis reported through the passive vaccine safety surveillance system and characterizing these in relation to background or expected rates of, of these particular outcomes. So from a surveillance perspective, the other thing I wanted to highlight in relation to, in, to the, the principle or the notion of enhanced surveillance is that Public Health Ontario, in terms of the role that we play in supporting passive vaccine safety surveillance um, led by local public health units, is that we can issue what we call enhanced surveillance directives that ask public health units to prioritize particular events. So there's all sorts of adverse events that are coming in into, their, into the public health unit as vaccine safety reports. And um, we have in relation to vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia or VIT, as well as myocarditis and pericarditis have issued directions to public health units to really prioritize these events, putting aside you know, other events to ensure that these are reported on the same day and that there is timely information collected from clinicians to ensure that we have, you know, complete reporting and very timely reporting. And the other piece on this, because these are uh, clinical entities that, you know, prior to the COVID-19 vaccine program were not clinical entities under, you know, regular uh, surveillance weren't expected adverse events following immunization for most other routine programs. The other thing that we have um, done in relation to these events is really worked with local public health units to support them in terms of the types of clinical information that they should be um, either requesting be completed on the on the AFI form or in the subsequent dialogue with reporting clinicians ensuring that these are entered into the surveillance system and these are really important for us at a provincial as well as at a national level to really um, have what we need in terms of the clinical information to say you know is what what level of certainty is this so from example from a Brighton collaboration perspective is this 
is this a level one event for myocarditis or in the setting of VIT, you know, looking at the, um, you know, very specific antibody levels that were, or, or um, pardon me, assays developed to, um, to look at uh, diagnosis of this event. So I just wanted to highlight that as an additional piece that I think we're very fortunate in Ontario to be able to have quite a dynamic system that allows us to have a lot of clinical pieces that are really important in terms of the the breadth and the the uh, high quality nature of the of the AP reports that we have in our system. So I wanted to extend this discussion on on VIT and also on myocarditis and pericarditis to reflect back on some of the early slides I had at the beginning of the talk, highlighting that the reason why we do passive vaccine safety surveillance is to determine if there is a vaccine safety issue is there any subsequent public health or programmatic action that can be taken to further reduce risk? And so I think although VIT as well as myocarditis and pericarditis have been um, you know, in many ways very challenging for the vaccine program, I think they're actually important examples to highlight that in response to these vaccine safety issues that you know, programmatic changes did occur. And so with VIT, I think most dramatically occurred in the setting of um, the spring after um, a number of, you know, quite serious VIT cases reported in Ontario, as well as in the setting of increased mRNA vaccine supply. Ontario was one of the first provinces to pause its first dose AstraZeneca program. And then in terms of myocarditis and pericarditis following mRNA vaccines, although this is, this is a very different event as compared to VIT, still something that through our work with passive vaccine safety surveillance data and also, you know, looking at Canadian data and seeing um, also findings from other jurisdictions um, have in both Ontario and in Canada have had uh, immunization guidance to um, specify product specific recommendations to reduce the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis. So this is in relation to Moderna versus Pfizer, um, as well as um, also supporting um, recommendations from NACI advising on an eight week recommended interval for the pediatric program after determining um, an association between a lower risk of myocarditis after longer intervals between dose one and two. And so I'll just provide an example of this. So this is um, a figure that is included in a recent preprint. It's been submitted for peer review, but um, this, and I also wanted to note that these findings have also been, um, similar findings have also been shown by our colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada, who've looked at a similar analysis using uh, CAFIS or the national data set, but just to orient you to this figure, this is looking at different schedules. So Moderna, Moderna, or individuals who have their priming, or pardon me, Pfizer, Pfizer, and then at the far right, individuals who have their priming dose with Pfizer and complete the series with Moderna. But you can see that regardless of all schedules, this one here, um, where you can see there's only there's some missing information. This is for people who start with Moderna and complete with Pfizer, which was a very, very rare schedule in place in Ontario. But you can see that across all of these different schedules that there is, there does appear to be an association with um, longer intervals. So an interval of at least eight weeks between dose one and dose two, um, having lower reporting rates of myocarditis and pericarditis um, that holds true across these different, uh, both homologous schedules as well as heterologous schedule in the setting of Pfizer followed by Moderna. So I think this just wanted to share this as an example of um, the types of insights that we have been able to gain from um, you know, real-time monitoring of the, of the COVID-19 vaccine program in both Ontario and in Canada. So next I'm gonna go into the final portion of the talk, which is where to find information on vaccine safety. And so I wanted to start first just by highlighting our weekly AFI report. This is a report we produce at Public Health Ontario and have updated it on a weekly basis since it was first produced in early January of 2021. And so the, the content in this report has evolved over time um, as the program has expanded with new products and new questions. Um, 
but I'll just highlight this is just a, an excerpt from the first table that um, looks at various A fees by different products and summarizes the number as well as the reporting rates. And although there's a lot of numbers and data here, I think, you know, to sort of elevate what is the broad conclusion from all of this, I think, first of all, it's really remarkable to reflect on the flat on the fact that in January of 2022, right now, you know, the Ontario program has involved the administration of more than 29 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines, which is really quite incredible to reflect on. And that when we reflect on the total number of AFI reports that have come in through the passive system of roughly 17,000 reports, that this represents only 0.06% of all of the doses administered. The overwhelming majority of these events, so approximately 94% of these are considered non-serious, and this is using a, a definition proposed and used by the WHO. Um, in large part, this really relates to um, hospitalization. And in terms of our serious events, um, you know, when we reflect it in relation to the 29 million doses administered in Ontario, these serious events represent only 0.003% of all doses administered. So I wanted to move on to also share some findings in relation to our pediatric program, because I know that everyone is very interested in what we're seeing in terms of passive vaccine safety surveillance finding from our from our own pro program in Ontario. So I think, you know, it's also great to reflect on the fact that we're past the milestone of half a million doses administered to date in Ontario. So this is data as of uh, January 16th, 2022, where we have had a total of a little more than 600,000 doses of the pediatric formulation of Pfizer uh, vaccine administered in Ontario. Um, we've received 79 AFI reports so far, and this represents uh, approximately 0.01% of all doses. And we've had only one, um, one serious event. This was um, an individual um, who was hospitalized for some, some uh, monitoring overnight. And this represents only 0.0001% of all pediatric doses administered. This is a figure that represents these, uh, these um, reports. So the 79 that I mentioned, all of these are following dose one. We haven't yet received any dose two reports yet, although um, children are just starting to receive their second doses. So we would expect that we, we would start to see those relatively soon. Um, and so you can see that, you know, we've received reports across the various ages represented in the program and fairly evenly between males and females. Um, and just noting that we have had one report in a four-year-old who was turning five at the end of the 2021 um, year. So that just is an explanation about that one event there for a four-year-old child who was eligible um, in, uh, based on the criteria. And then uh, this slide is a slide that highlights, you know, and characterizes the AFI reports that we've received in relation to their timing um, in relation to vaccination. So you can see that about 56% of our reports um, have occurred on the day of immunization. And so I think when you see the reports, that will make sense in terms of the types of events that we're seeing most commonly reported, which is represented in this table here. So just to orient you to this data, just very briefly, um, the 79 reports that I mentioned represent 79 children. And in any one AFI report, there may be one or more adverse event reported. And so that's why this column here does not add up to um, 79 and why if you look at this as a proportion, uh, you, you arrive at a total of slightly more than 100. So that's just to orient you in terms of the 79 reports and then the various events reported here. So I think what I take away from this table is that the most common report, or pardon me, the most common events that are um, brought forward through these reports are things that we would already be, um, you know, somewhat expecting as possible events following immunization in terms of manifestations of allergy. So we've had the most common report type is an allergic skin reaction. We've also had the second most common are um, syncopal events or fainting associated with injury. So I think this is a really good example and reminder of the various procedures um, to be put in place in immunization clinics to, to try to prevent these events from happening um, 
rash. And then just to highlight that the fourth most common event here described as other severe or unusual, this represents events that are not meeting the criteria for other events. And I can share that of these eight, we've had one child who's had a severe headache, and then the other seven are children who had self-limited chest pain uh, that resolved spontaneously or with over-the-counter pain medication. And some of those children were worked up for myocarditis and did not have any abnormal lab findings. So that's what's represented in those um, events there. We have had one event of myocarditis after the first dose. Um, and uh, the, um, this, in, this report is still under investigation to the extent that you know, this, this child may possibly have had other, other potential explanations for, for this myocarditis event. I also wanted to make sure that there is mention of the other um, excellent uh, Canadian data that's out there and available, and that includes weekly data from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, so this is just a, a quick screenshot from their website. The web link is listed below, and the Public Health Agency of Canada is updating their data on a weekly basis. Um, and so this is very dynamic and there is always strength in numbers when we're talking about passive vaccine safety surveillance. So you can see here that the, the data from Canada is representing um, AFIs following more than 72 million doses administered. And then the other thing just to highlight from the FAC reporting or their information on their website is that they also have some very nice figures that allow you to toggle between numbers and rates and if you want to look at it for all COVID-19 vaccines or specific products. So I wanted to be sure to highlight um, you know, some very, very nice data and very nice information that's also updated um, on a weekly basis and available through the Public Health Agency of Canada. So I think that brings us to the close of the slides that I've prepared. I wanted just to briefly summarize and highlight the um, main messages that I hope are with you following this brief presentation today. One is the critical importance that vaccine safety surveillance plays in the ongoing monitoring of vaccine programs and the important insights and findings that can arise from vaccine safety surveillance that can be used to tie into vaccine pro programs um, in terms of additional counseling or possibly even um, program modifications to further reduce the risk of, of rare and very rare adverse events. And then finally, wanted just to ensure that I really impress upon everyone participating participating today or, or listening offline, the critical role that healthcare providers play in reporting AFIs. I think the strength of our passive vaccine safety surveillance system is only as strong and as robust as, as the clinician community who are engaged in reporting these events. And so really wanted to ensure that I encourage everyone to, to report any adverse events that, that they find in the course of their um, work and just really emphasize the value that these reports play in this larger picture of vaccine safety monitoring in Ontario and in Canada. So my final slide just acknowledges that the number of people at PHO who all play a role in vaccine safety, this includes our vaccine safety team, it also includes our epidemiologists who are working with the COVAX data to be able to generate the denominators and a chain, you know, looking at various heterologous homologous schedules and the complexity of our denominators when we're doing vaccine safety surveillance and our colleagues at ICES. And I wanted also to really mention our colleagues at Ontario Public Health Units who are doing um, phenomenal work in terms of their investigations and reporting and support of vaccine safety surveillance work. So I will uh, turn it back and very happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Sarah, for that comprehensive presentation that shed some light on what is happening at the public health level, looking at vaccine safety, that there's a lot of work being done, multidisciplinary team, and there's collaboration between both local, provincial, and national units. So I will invite uh, all the participants to post their questions on the in the Q Q and A session, and then uh, we'll be able to address them as you post them. So uh, let me begin, uh, Sarah, by asking: So, what relationship has NACI got with uh, 
uh, the provincial agencies. I see that you sit on both, which is quite strategic. But uh, is, is there a formal relationship between NACI uh, and what the public health units and uh, the uh, federal public health uh, agency does? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd say that in terms of the role that NACI has in terms of its relationship with uh, groups carrying out vaccine safety surveillance, there the main linkage between NACI is with um, the vaccine safety team of the Public Health Agency of Canada. So, you know, as part of um, the deliberations at NACI, there is regular updating of the committee in terms of findings from um, the Canadian Adverse Event Following Immunization Surveillance system and um, and then in addition to that's a description of the the larger group of NACI but then there's also a vaccine safety working group of NACI so you know more in-depth discussions that then are brought you know discussed in the in a working group format and then brought back to the to the membership so I'd say you know there is very you know the the fact vaccine safety data is really cr crucial and essential to the vaccine safety discussions. Um, that occur at NASI, absolutely. Upton. Oh, thank you, Sarah. That's wonderful, as always. Sarah, um, along that, you know, same line of uh, questioning from, from Isaac, um, is there a relationship uh, with the CDC or ACIP, or is it uh, any sort of a formal or, you know, informal um, opportunities for uh, data exchange. Um, and, and so, you know, specifically, uh, after you've answered that, I'll ask you to comment on what we know about the myocarditis signal in the United States in the five to 11 years. Age. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question as well. So I, so in terms of, uh, you know, ACIP specifically, but I think also in terms of other other um, countries or groups, you know, there have been invitations uh, to those groups to present their vaccine safety data, either to the NACI um, vaccine safety working group or to NACI as a whole in terms of sharing those findings and sharing them, you know, oftentimes in confidence before some of that data is available in the public realm. And so I think that's been very important. And I say that also, especially in terms of our Canadian and Ontario experience with myocarditis and pericarditis. Um, you know, Ontario, we've been very, Public Health Ontario in particular, been quite transparent in terms of putting that data out in publicly available um, epi reports and summaries. And as I think in large part, as a, as a consequence of that, have been invited to other, other groups, including um, uh, vaccine safety meetings of CDC to, to share that data with them as well, as well as other advisory committees. Um, so I think that that um, certainly occurs in terms of the sharing of information um, between different jurisdictions. I'd say, you know, um, it's typically at a national level. And I think it's just been because in Ontario, we've, we've produced a lot of data and reporting on myocarditis that we've been invited to, to several of those sessions, just to describe our, our own analytic work side by side with what the Public Health Agency of Canada has also produced. And then I think your other question was about myocarditis in relation to what the CDC has been finding. Is that correct? So I think you know the one of the one of the although there is always challenges in vaccine safety and I think you know there's always reflections for us as a system to be reflecting on you know transparency and risk communication my sense is that uh, the CDC has been very transparent in their reporting of myocarditis um, and updating ACIP through their public facing meetings as that signal has been investigated. Um, so what I've seen is what's available through the ACIP presentations, which have described, um, you know, a number of, uh, a small number of events. Um, I think, again, sort of similar to what was 
um, expected in terms of, you know, tending to be more common after dose two versus dose one, but small in number, um, relatively mild from a clinical perspective, and then also, um, you know, from a observed versus expected perspective in terms of how high that reporting rate is, seeing it, you know, um, being you know greater than what would be expected in terms of baseline rates but not at the same um you know not at the same sort of uh level of reporting rates that have been seen in in the adolescence so i think that's the other piece as well that you know what's being seen uh his, with the mrna program is you know young adults older adolescents having the highest less so for the sort of younger adolescents and and probably less so for the 5 to 11 so so that's sort of what i take from the cdc data that has been presented and i suspect that there'll be you know additional information that will still come from their their work looking at myocarditis and we certainly intend to really continue our our work in ontario looking at it i think it will be very interesting for us to see um, you know, I think there will be relatively small numbers, but there will be quite a variety of dose intervals that have been used in the in the Ontario program. Uh, so it will be interesting to for us to look at, you know, if and when we receive any reports of myocarditis after the second dose, um, you know, if those are and what, what's the relationship of those events in, in terms of the interval between the dose one and dose two. We don't have any events after dose two. So there is, you know, this is just me sort of elaborating on what we would plan to do, but we haven't had any, any of those events yet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any question posted, but still on that uh, line of uh, discussion, any role that the WHO plays at all in being a repository of, uh, of information, it seems to me that the larger the pool of data, the more likely you are going to pick a, a rare signal that will be of uh, some significance. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that. As I was going through my schema of um, the reporting pathways in Ontario and Canada, I was realizing that I should I should have also included that final piece of the slide that wasn't there. That includes uh, the reporting and sharing of information across countries to um, to support international vaccine safety monitoring efforts. So the WHO has the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. And so they've issued a number of reports and statements over the course of the pandemic in terms of their, you know, summarizing the data that they've reviewed and what's, um, you know, what their conclusions are in terms of, you know, a range of vaccine safety issues. Um, so absolutely, that that's a very important group. And as you say, you know, in terms of the numbers, I mean, when we're looking at rare events, you know, we really do um, need large numbers of doses administered to identify those. And, um, and I think there's always a need for international collaboration when we're, we're looking at rare events. Absolutely. Great point. Thank you. Right. And uh, because this is a pandemic, are there lessons that are being learned that will inform overall vaccine surveillance going forward? That's a really excellent question. And I think about that because I think that, you know, we, um, it will be very interesting to see how our, um, even, even just sort of the, the structure and the intensity of this work will carry forward to routine monitoring. I think that, you know, in all organizations, there has been a huge emphasis, rightly so, placed on vaccine safety. Um, and, you know, we have new team members, um, you know, I, I'd say from a PHO perspective, you know, new relationships with, you know, doing that, you know, work with ICS, looking at background rates, trying to do this in almost real time. So I think there are a lot of really important um, relationships and networks and, you know, team members um, to really carry this work forward. Um, but I think, you know, on the other hand, I think it, it still is also unprecedented for us to have administered 29 million doses 
in uh, you know approximately a 12 month period of time. So even though you know we have uh, our annual influenza immunization program, you know it, it is nothing in comparison in terms of those numbers. Um, so I think just the sort of scope, scale, and intensity of the vaccine safety work um, has has really been different for COVID-19. Um, but absolutely, I think there will be a lot of um, you know I think a lot of really important aspects that will be able to car be carried forward to routine program monitoring for for other programs including influenza but but also other important routine childhood immunizations and other and other programs as well captain so sarah thank you so much so so one of the the challenges that we faced um sarah um and on the front line of um uh, as I, myself and others in uh, trying to educate people uh, about vaccines and vaccine-related adverse events is um, the, the misuse and misinterpretation of surveillance data uh, on the part of um, uh, hesitant folks um, in, from the communities. Um, uh, who have access to such data, for example, the CDC database. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you, well, we searched the CDC database and we saw where there, you know, uh, scores and scores of people have died after getting the vaccine. And so the whole idea of how reports are, you know, put out there in the interest of transparency without making that cause and effect um, link um, in, a, in an explicit way can be challenging. You want to speak to that issue um, in terms of moving forward? Maybe um, that sort of our data might be inappropriate data to have in the public domain because it's, uh, uh, it, you know, it's misleading and, and would be, might be misinterpreted by someone who doesn't know how to, to read the data. Yeah. Yes, th thank you. For, for the question and also articulating the issue so well. I think that this is, I think, a, a real tension, I would say. That's my my sort of uh, terminology, not, not anyone else's, but, you know, in terms of, you know, on the one hand, being transparent and, you know, this is this is, you know, what the experience is and, you know, these are the reports, um, but also recognizing that, the, um, you know, it's this very complex terrain in terms of, you know, as you say, like these are events that are temporally associated with vaccine, not necessarily causally um, associated and, and most or many of them will not be causally associated, but, you know, what is that right balance? And I think that, um, I think that it is, it is a, it is a real challenge. I think at Public Health Ontario, we've tried our best to you know, we provide a lot of information, but sort of summarize it. We don't have, um, and in fact, in Canada, there is no, currently um, in terms of the reports in CAFIS, there is no analogous sort of downloading of individual reports similar to VAERS, but I know people in Canada still do mine the VAERS website or a database to, to do their own analyses. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but I think, you know, is um, something that really requires, um, you know, strong, nuanced, clear communication when there are vaccine safety products. But I think also it's the other, you know, unison of voices around the data supporting the safety of the vaccine program, supporting, you know, this is why we do vaccine safety surveillance. This is what we're doing. We're doing it in real time. We're committed. Here are the examples of how we've modified programs to ensure the ongoing safety. And, um, you know, I think, you know, unfortunately, people who have an agenda to support misinformation or disinformation will continue that. Um, and um, I think we need to really focus on the, the unison of voices supporting the, the safety of the program, our, you know, collective experiences and our are the value of the surveillance data and how it's used, but it's not an easy task. I, I acknowledge that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, on that note, on behalf of the STEP program, Sarah, I want to thank you very much for this uh, well-delivered comprehensive session. 
I think it illustrates that uh, maybe uh, members of the public have to hear more from, from, from the work you do to understand that there are people who commit all their lives just looking at safety and that they, they can be rest assured that people like you and others have their backs in terms of uh, looking at vaccine safety. So we thank you for this session. And I want to uh, ask all the participants that would like to know your feedback about these sessions because they help us develop better uh, programs going forward. So on that note, thank you all for participating and let us keep up the messaging that these vaccines are so safe, adverse, serious adverse events are so rare that uh, the public should have confidence in vaccines. Thank you very much, Sarah, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. Bye-bye.